Hello oh, and welcome back to the Cracking Vein YouTube channel. Today we're going to be solving lead code problem 636, exclusive time of functions. Before we do, you guys know the drill, like and leave a comment on the video, it helps so much with the YouTube algorithm. Alright, let's read the question prompt. On a single threaded CPU, we execute a program containing n functions. Each function has a unique ID between 0 and n-1. Function calls are stored in a call stack. When a, call, a function call starts, its ID is pushed onto the stack, and when a function call ends, its ID is popped off of the stack. The function whose ID is at the top of the stack is the current function being executed. Each time a function starts or ends, we write a log with the ID, whether it started or ended, and the timestamp. You are given a list of logs, where logs of i represents the ith log message formatted as a string function ID colon start or end, colon timestamp. For example, 0 start 3 means a function call with ID 0 started at the beginning of timestamp 3, and 1 and 2 means a function call with the function ID 1 ended at time 2. Note that a function can be called multiple times, possibly recursively. A function's exclusive time is the sum of all the execution times for function calls in the program. For example, if a function is, is called twice, one call executing two time units and another call executing for one time unit, the exclusive time is 2 plus 1 equals 3. Return the exclusive time of each function in an array where the value at the ith index represents the exclusive time for the function with id 1. Fuck me, that was a lot of reading. Jesus Christ, is this an English exam or a lead code question? Anyway. As you can see, there's an absolute wall of text here. Let's get rid of this and actually look at an example because there is fuck all room to actually do anything here. So I'm going to erase this and I'll be back in a second. We wiped away all of that text. Now let's actually solve the question and we're going to have a few functions here. So I'm going to change my colors as we go. But essentially, we start function zero at time zero. So let's kind of write that and we'll have our number line here. And it looks like function zero starts here, and then the next function starts at time two. So let's kind of write a few things on our number line, and it looks like we go up to six. Just for clarity, I'll write it out because it might be a little bit confusing. So six is kind of the end point there. So let's use red to depict function zero. So function zero will start at time zero, and it will run up until time two at which point function one will start at time two, and it will actually run until the end of time five. So function one kicks off here at time two and runs all the way to the end of the minute five, right? And then what's gonna happen then is that uh, function one will resume again, because remember it's a single threaded, so only one thing can run at a time. So it's gonna run from the start of the sixth minute until the end of the sixth minute. So function zero, as you can see, runs for one, two, three units of time. So runs for three units. And then if we go back to our blue here, uh, function one will run for how long? Well, it runs here, that's one unit, here another unit, here another unit, and then here another unit, so four. So our solution should be uh, three, four because remember the index here represents the function ID and function zero runs for three and function one runs for four units of time. So that's essentially what we want to do uh, to solve this question. But the way that we do that is going to be a little bit tricky. And we know that we have a single threaded function and that we were told to use a call stack. So that's actually the data structure that we want to use here is we're gonna use a stack to basically represent what is currently running and what was running before. Because remember, we first start function zero and then it's function one, right? And function one, this is the only function that can ever end, right? We can't end function zero before function one ends because it's a single threaded CPU. So by definition, whenever we get an end uh, log that comes up, it will always pop the top of the stack because that's how single threaded applications work, right? We can't have an application in the background finish before the one that's currently running. Whatever we get an end, it's always going to be popping from the top. 
and then we can calculate the difference in the time from when we started and the current time when we're ending. And then once we pop the top, uh, when we get an end, then the next one that is currently running will run. And it's either going to run until we get another start, in which case something will populate the stack, or it will end. And then we can simply calculate the time difference and put it into our, um, um, our array to actually store the, the results here. So that's essentially what we want to do. So if we get a start, what are we going to do? We're going to um, you know, push to the stack, push to stack. And then if we get an end, we're going to pop from the stack and we're going to find the delta of the time, right? Because we obviously have to figure out the time that it ends. And you have to be a little bit careful because when you get an end, it's actually inclusive, right? So here it says five. And if you accidentally calculated it to the five itself, uh, that would be wrong. You'd get three units, but it's actually it ends at the end of five, but it starts at the beginning of one. So when it says start, it's starting at literally two, but ending, it's actually ending at, you know, what it is technically time six uh, right before then. So you have to be careful about that when calculating the deltas. But other than that, that's the idea. When you get a start, push it to the stack and keep track of the time. When you get an end, pop it from the stack and then we just need to calculate the delta. So how we're gonna do this is actually quite simple. Let's go to the code editor and type this out. This question is really simple and not that bad. If you can kind of grasp your head around, you know, this timeline, how it works and also around the call stack, how essentially you're only going to be popping, um, you know, whatever's at the top because it's a single threaded application. So when something ends, it's always going to be whatever the top of the stack is. You don't have to worry about any of these lower ones uh, actually finishing before because again, it's single threaded. So that's enough talking. Let's actually go to the code editor and type this up. It's really simple. It's probably like 20 lines of code. So I'll see you there. We are in the code editor. Let's type this up. So remember that we need to return a list where the index is going to be the time that the ith function runs for. So we're going to have to create a list uh, for our solution, which is actually going to be uh, of length, whatever n is, right? So we'll call it execution times. And we will basically just set this equal to zero times n, right? Because obviously we haven't computed anything uh, yet. So obviously the times are zero. And n is the um, you know number of functions, so that's how long it should be. Anyway, we need a variable to keep track of our call stack, so let's call it call stack, and we'll have an empty list here. And we need to keep track of the time when the previous function started, because we can use that to actually calculate the difference between when it ends and when it actually started. So we're going to say previous start time, and this is going to be zero. And now we need to actually parse the logs. So we're going to say for log in logs, uh, we're going to say the function ID. Why is it doing that? That's so weird. Um, I had my code here before. Anyway, that's weird. So we're going to say the call type. Uh, so remember that the uh, the way it is, it's uh, the ID. So it was like ID, the type and the timestamp, right? So we're going to say function ID, call type, and timestamp is going to equal to log dot split, uh, log dot split on colon, right? So that's how we're going to be doing it. And remember that splitting it is going to give us strings. So we actually need to say it's an integer because we need to use the actual integer to access the index. And obviously we can't do that with strings. So we're going to say function ID is going to be an int of whatever function ID is. And we also need to do the same thing for the timestamp because obviously we can't do math with strings. So we're going to call integer on the timestamp. And there we go. We have processed that part of the result. Now, obviously, we have two types of, you know, call we can have. It can either be an end of a function or the start of a function. So we're going to say if call type, uh, call type equals to what? If it's a start, what do we want to do? Remember, uh, what we want to do is we want to basically put something onto the stack, right? So if we have a call stack, so basically if something was running before, then we need to update the amount of time that that thing was running. And remember, the amount of time that it was running for was whatever the time was when it started minus the current time. So if we have something on the call stack, then we need to account for the time that it just spent running. So 
we're gonna say execution times of whatever is on the top of the call stack. So call stack of minus one. We wanna add to that value in execution times, because remember in the call stack, we're just gonna put the function ID. And we wanna put, we wanna add to the value because we wanna sum the amount of time that it's just been running. And that is gonna be the current timestamp minus the previous start time. So previous start time was when the last function started running. Obviously timestamp is our current function and we wanna update the time for whatever the previous function that is running uh, in execution time. So we wanna take account of the time that it's been running since basically started because now we're calling the function I guess recursively. So we want to basically, or some functions being called inside of R1. So processing for the current function is gonna stop and the next one's gonna begin. So now that we've done that, uh, we actually wanna add, you know, our current function to the call stack because it's starting. So now the current function that's running is whatever function ID is. Um, and then what we wanna do is we wanna update the previous start time. So obviously the new start time when this function started running is our current timestamp. So we're just gonna assign that to timestamp. And that's all you have to do if it is a start command, right? Otherwise, it's an end command. So let's take care of that. So we're gonna say execute, oops, exit, execution times. So remember the top of the stack is the function that's currently running. And obviously we just got an end command. So we want to process that. So we're actually gonna say call stack dot pop. So we're gonna pop from the top of the call stack, which is gonna give us the function ID that's currently running. And to that value in the actual execution times array, we want to add the difference between the current timestamp and the previous timestamp uh, where the function started, which we store in prev start time. But remember, since the endpoint is actually inclusive, uh, we need to actually add one to account for the fact that um, we are including that endpoint because remember the end is actually up until the end of whatever the the timestamp is like we saw in the example if you actually don't count it and just use the difference between the timestamp and the prev start time you're actually going to have an off by one error so make sure that you have this plus one here now the last thing we need to do obviously our function has now ended and whatever is next in the call stack can now begin and it's actually going to begin at you know, whatever, um, you know, the timestamp plus one is, right? So basically our function runs up until the timestamp and then on the next one, uh, so timestamp plus one is actually when it starts up again, because remember this timestamp is, it's going up until the end of it. So be careful with the boundaries here. You do need these plus ones here, otherwise you'll throw yourself off. So that is how you handle starts and we just handled ends. So all we need to do now is simply return return the execution time. So um, where's my submit? Okay, let's just find it. Let me make sure I didn't make any syntax mistakes and it looks good here. So let's submit this and ah, okay. So we are accepted, brilliant. Okay, so let us think about the time and space complexity here. So. Time complexity wise, as you can see, we go over all of the logs and we do it once. We process each one individually. So this is gonna be big O of N because we just have to process every single log. There are N logs in our thing here. So it's just gonna take big O of N time to process them all. For the space, whoops, so sp time is big O of N. Space is also gonna be big O of N because we need this execution times uh, which is essentially going to store our result here. And this is obviously length n, where n is the number of um, you know functions we have. And then also we have the call stack, which is going to be dependent on the number of logs we have. In the worst case, we're just gonna have uh, the recursive functions happening at the beginning. So that means that half of the array would be taken up uh, in the call stack, and then we would actually start popping them. So this is where we get the big O of n. So, that is how you solve this question, big O of N on the time, big O of N on the space. I implore you, if you didn't quite understand this part, to go back in with the diagram and kind of walk through it uh, piece by piece and see how it works. But essentially, the thing you have to remember here is that it's a single threaded machine, right? Which means that whenever you end a function, 
uh, that will always be whatever is at the top of the stack, right? You cannot finish something below it because it's single threaded. So whatever is currently running needs to finish before anything else can start up again. So that is really the crucial part to understanding this question. Everything else is kind of just like mechanically actually coding it up. Anyway, that's enough blabbing. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave a like and a comment. It helps me tremendously with the YouTube algorithm. Otherwise, if you want to see more content like this, subscribe to the channel. If you want to join our Discord community, which uh, we basically talk about all things Fang, lead code questions, interview preparation, system design, you can have your resume reviewed by me, you can ask me random questions. If that sounds interesting to you, join the Discord channel. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and have a great rest of your day.